We've been doing this series about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Have you been enjoying it? Yeah, yeah good. Okay, I need that encouragement. That's great. Uh, and uh, it's been fantastic. And so if you have missed out on them so far, you can catch up online. Uh, we're finally going to make it to Matthew chapter 5, which is where we wanted to start, but we had to have all this pre-context to get there. So we're finally going to be there today. So if you've got your Bibles with you, you can pre-turn there. Uh, if you've got phone Bible with you, then good for you. I'm glad you brought your phone instead of your Bible to church. Um, oh, just please make sure it's on silent or do not disturb or something like that. Um, yeah, grab that, Matthew 5, that's where we're going to be. I'm going to be in the ESV version, the English Standard Version, but you do whatever version you do, that's fine. Uh, in the Beatitudes we will be today, it's all pretty similar. Uh, if you haven't been with us or if we just need a summary recap, hopefully we've got something we can put on the screen here to just give you a recap of where we've been. Uh, we've been the kingdom of God is the realm of God's effective will. What does that mean? It's the, it's the realm where what he says actually happens in our lives and in our world. It's good news because it's the way of true human flourishing. Last week we talked about all the different good newses in this world and, the, and what they promise about human flourishing, but we talked about how the kingdom of God is the way of true human flourishing. It's what we've all been looking for our whole lives, a way to truly flourish, and we can find it in the kingdom of God. Jesus is the example of living this good news by living completely in the kingdom of God. He mastered life. He got killed for it, but he mastered life. He mastered God relationships and human relationships and integrating living in God's kingdom through every element of his life. He is our example. And we too can enter this good news of his kingdom by moving from self-reliance to God-reliance. Because when we rely on God, he is the source of life, and that source becomes available to us. And the good news of the kingdom of God invites us to be followers, engaged in his rule, not simply believers or attenders. This is the good life. This is the good life. The kingdom of God life is the good life. I mean, when you get little ads pop up on your phone, they're telling you, they're trying to tell you what the good life is, but this is the good life. You can come to church and hear about the good life. It's much more reliable. It's worked for 2,000 years. It's led people to the good life. The good life. When those products have been and gone and deteriorated, this will remain because it is the good life. And so now we finally get to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7 is the longest recorded discourse or teaching or message or preach or whatever you want to call it from Jesus. And it's all about the kingdom of God, like all of his messages. It is the most concise, complete version of Jesus' teaching on how to live in the kingdom in our lives. And it's good to know like where the message is heading so that you know how important the message is on the way there. Because it finishes in Matthew 7, 24, and Jesus says, everyone who hears and obeys or does what I have taught in this message will have a life that stands against all of the elements. We'll have a life that holds up against the pressures. He uses this illustration of storms and buildings, and it won't be a house built on the sand, but it'll be like we sung, a house built on the rock. It'll stand up against the time, and that's why it's an eternal life, because it stands up, because it holds on, because it lasts. It's an eternal life now because of the type of life it is. And so if that's where the message is heading, we should really tune our ears into the message. If that's how important it is, not just of things to know, but things to do and to live in and obey if it causes our life to hold up. But, you know, who's... And, and in this whole message, he really, everything is divided into two things in Matthew 5 through 7. It's divided into the two big questions of humanity. Which life is the good life? And who is truly a good person? Which life is the good life, and who is truly a good person? Which life is the good life, and who is truly a good person? But who is assured 
of such a life was a lot. It was, a, it was an issue of controversy in Jesus' day, and it still is today. Who is a good person? Who's truly saved? Who's really found the truth and who isn't? And that is exactly where we begin this conversation today. It's Jesus ask, answering the question, who is in on this good life? If the kingdom of God is the good life, who is in on this good life? So let's read Matthew 5, uh, one, starting in verse 1. It says, seeing the crowds, let's just note here which crowds, the ones that were talked about, we've been talking about the last few weeks in Matthew 4, the poor, the sick, the people oppressed, the people that all gravitated and followed Jesus. It was the riffraff of humanity, the misfits. The outcasts, this is the crowd, okay? Seeing this crowd, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revel you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are what are called in the Scripture the Beatitudes, the blessed attitudes. The Beatitudes. We're going to use the word blessed a lot today. I hope you're ready for that. It's a very Christian word, but there is no better word. There is no other word. There is no, like to say flourish, to say God-given flourishing. Like this is maybe as close as we could get God favored. You know, these are the most, but but it, it doesn't quite grab all of blessed. So we'll just use blessed, okay? If you're wondering, don't let it just wash over you. Let it be like, oh, God favored. Let it be, oh, like flourishing in God's sense. Let it be, oh, like God, his his mark is on my life. Oh, there's a holiness coming towards me because this is all of what blessed contains, okay? This this passage, Matthew chapter 5, we have to realize is like one of the great human literary treasures, It stands out amongst the Bible. It's like Psalm 23 stands out amongst the Psalms. It's like 1 Corinthians 13 stands out amongst the letters. You know, if you're every second Christian wedding you go to, you get in 1 Corinthians 13, you know. Love is kind, love is patient. These are the treasures. The Lord's Prayer, which we'll come up against in this whole discourse, is, 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 is a treasure. These are like, these are poetic, beautiful bits of writing that just, they keep grabbing humanity. And this is what it is, but this has to be one of the most misunderstood ones in all of the Bible. This has to be one of the most misunderstood ones. Uh, It's often misunderstood as these are qualities we need to possess or something we need to be like. And I think many of us have always read it our lives like that. But if we read it like that, this either has people not seeing themselves in the story of Jesus, like the rich, or like the not hungry, or it leads people who do possess these sort of things to some sort of spiritual pride as if they're better than people who don't. But this is not the way Jesus meant them to be heard. See, these are his beatitudes, not ours. They are his way of helping form his talk about the kingdom of God, his life message. And so we're not free to do with them how we will. We must understand what he was trying to do with them if we are to understand them. They're part of his life message. And so we shall begin by looking at the context. The context matters, right? That crowd, remember? 
the sick, the raw humanity pressing against him, the tired, the outcasts, the foreigners, the poor, they are hanging on his every word. He doesn't draw away from them. It actually talks about he elevates himself so he can speak to them all at once. He's not speaking to the high and mighty. He's not just speaking to his 12 disciples. This raw version of humanity were his disciples. He's not having an intellectual talk to the top class of philosophers and and thinkers. He's talking every day to the people struggling to get through the day. This talk isn't something to be philosophized about. It's something to be received as it is given. Really, he's saying this. He's saying, blessed are the spiritual zeros. You know, it's interesting in Luke's version because Matthew's like quite nice. He goes, blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke just goes, blessed are the poor. It's like somebody tried to tidy it up along the way. Blessed are the poor would make more sense because it's like, he then he goes, blessed are those who are hungry and blessed are those who aren't getting what they want yet. And like, you know, like it would make sense. It's important to remember these other versions of it. But blessed are the spiritual zeros, the spiritually bankrupt, the deprived, the deficient, the spiritual beggars, those without a wisp of religion when the kingdom of heaven comes upon them. Oh, they're blessed. That's sort of what he's getting at. These spiritual zeros, the ones who have no qualifications or abilities. You wouldn't call on them when the spiritual work needs to be done. They're like the apostles of Jesus when they were first beginning. They didn't make it into the schools of the rabbis. They didn't grow up in church homes. They didn't show any giftedness or charisma. And nobody ever looked at their life and thought, I can see the breath of God on them. They didn't know their Bible. They didn't get called upon to pray. At best, they could fill a seat. They don't claim to make any sense of God, yet when the kingdom of God comes upon them, blessed, blessed. The spiritually poor don't get the kingdom because they're poor, but because of the kingdom, even they have become blessed. And it's important distinction. The problem with the common reading of, this, of these Beatitudes is, is, is this. It, it isn't saying that this state is good or praiseworthy. It isn't saying that being spiritually poor is admirable or even preferred or even needed. They're not blessed because of their condition. They're blessed in spite of it. They're blessed in spite of their deplorable spiritual condition. The, heaven, the kingdom of heaven has moved redemptively upon their life through the grace of Jesus. And that's why Jesus calls them blessed. I mean, we could put up another quote. Maybe if we could put that up on, on there. This is fantastic. In the Sermon on the Mount, the promises attaching, for example, for the so-called Beatitudes must not be regarded as the reward of the spiritual states with which they are respectively connected, nor yet as their result. It is not because a man is poor in spirit that his is the kingdom of heaven. In, this, in, in the sense that no one state will grow into the other or be the result. Still less is the one with the reward of the other. The connecting link in each is the case Christ himself because he has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers because there are many spiritually poor who are not blessed. There are many who are hungry and thirsty who are not blessed because the kingdom of heaven is yet to move upon their life. If we read it like this, it could work without Jesus, right? Right? Because we could earn something. We could have a right to it. We could do it without him and his grace. Jesus, I'm poor in spirit, so you owe me blessing. We don't need mercy because we've turned our lack of virtue into a virtue. We've said, I've got egg on my face. I'm spiritually poor, but somehow that's good and God owes me something. We've turned the very states that are deplorable into admirable. If we read it like this, it's a salvation. It leads to salvation by works or by having the right attitude. And we know from everything else Jesus teaches that that can't be what he intended. 
Never would Jesus say, because you've been persecuted, that's what saves you. That is just not the way Jesus teaches. And also it would mean if you're not on the list, then you can't be blessed. Which for most of you would be a real shame. Because <laughs> it would be, otherwise it would like you would read the inverse, something like this. How sad for those of you who have wealth, that's all the comfort that you'll ever have. How sad for you who are well fed, it won't help in the hunger to come. How sad for you who are laughing it up now, grief and tears are on their way. How sad when everyone says you're wonderful, their fathers said the same about the lying prophets. This is what happens when we read this as these are things to be desired. It will inevitably, if you play this out logically, you have to end up saying things like this. But that is not what Jesus was getting at. They're not recommended ways of being well off before God. They are explanations and illustrations drawn from his crowd, his immediate setting about the present availability of the kingdom of God through personal relationship with Jesus. The present availability of the kingdom of God through personal relationship with Jesus. They are illustrations of that. The Beatitudes cannot be good news if they're understood as how-tos. They can't be good news because that would just be a new legalism. That would just be a new list of things you have to do to get what you need from God. And they certainly wouldn't be throwing open the kingdom of God to anyone. In fact, they'd be doing anything but that. They'd be closing the doors to many people. To really appreciate what Jesus is getting at, you have to appreciate how Jesus taught in general. Like Jesus always used examples right in front of people. He exaggerated them a bit to show that how people thought the world was is not how it is. That's just like constantly what he did. Like this rich young ruler, there's a story, this rich young ruler, this really wealthy, well-off, admired person came to him. And in his day and age, Jesus thought, oh, like everybody thought that anyone who was rich and well-off was clearly favored and blessed by God. That's like how people, and people maybe even still think that way a little bit. Like if you're well-off, that's a sign that God has had his fortunate hand upon your life. And that's how people thought. And so when this rich young ruler comes to Jesus, goes, what must I do to get eternal life? He's like, well, have you done all the things I already said to do? Like all the commandments. He's like, yeah, yeah I've been nailing them. <laughs> and then Jesus goes, well, maybe I'll just give you one more then. Why don't you sell everything you have, give it away to people who need it more than you do, and just come follow me? And the rich young ruler really tossed it up. He really loved God. He had been following him. But in this one moment, Jesus revealed something of his heart that he actually cared more about his money than Jesus. And then he turns to his disciples who were like, whoa, you know, like this is, we didn't even know. We thought he was awesome. We thought we were supposed to be like him. And, and he goes, do you know, it's so hard for the rich to enter heaven. So hard for the rich to get into the kingdom of God. And they're like, what? We thought the rich already had the kingdom of God. The rich. And he's taking what's right in front of them and showing them that life is not always as it seems. But you know what he's not saying? He's not saying it's really easy for the poor to enter the kingdom of God. And then he goes on, well, with man it's impossible. Well, with God, all things are possible. But we read that like he's saying it's hard for rich people and easy for poor people, but I find it's hard for all people. <laughs> Except if God moves upon our lives. But with God, all things are possible. And can you see, he, he's like getting at this thing. He, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan in the context of who is your neighbor when somebody's really trying to have like an intellectual discussion about love, which you just got to get over real quick. Like he's trying to dodge the loopholes of love, you know, which I think is just shows you've missed it. And he's like, like imagine it's Sunday morning. Imagine it's Sunday morning and there's like a person and they're, they've been like in a car crash and they need help getting their car back on the road 
and they're like cut up and they're bloody and they but they could get their car out of the ditch and then all of a sudden a pastor is driving along and uh, he's going that way but he's already in his church clothes so he and he's late for the gathering so he just presses on past and then imagine imagine like a priest comes along and the same thing he's already got his big gown on he's got all dressed up Mass is about to start. So he just hurries on past. But then coming not even in that direction, but in the opposite direction, is somebody, maybe like a prostitute, who's just finished her late night shift and heading home in the morning. And it's so inconvenient for her, but she crosses over and she helps this person and she... She helps them get their car out. She pays for everything to get fixed. She follows them home, makes sure everything, that they have everything they need. And then Jesus goes, which one do you think really loved their neighbor? And he goes, see, the way you think it is in the kingdom of God is not always the way it is. The way things look on the outside, it's, it's like 1 Samuel 6, 7, where it says, the Lord sees not as man sees, but man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Or Jesus would say this himself in Luke 16, 15, you who, are, who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This is how Jesus taught. He, he showed them the way they think it is is not always the way it is. And this is what he's doing in the Beatitudes. Look, we must understand, unless you have like zero diversity of friends, that there are people who please God and have his blessing without being poor, without being hungry, without being grief-stricken, or without being persecuted. They trust Jesus with all their heart, and they love and they serve their neighbors in his name. Their hearts are full of peace and joy and believing, and they do justice, they love mercy, and they walk humbly with, those, with their God. And only those blinded by their prior thinking can continue to insist that everyone be on the list of the blessed in order to receive the blessing of God. Are we getting what we're trying to say this morning? See... Well, I mean, we should understand this because like COVID and everything, unless you're a, a New Zealand citizen or a celebrity or a sports person, you ain't getting into the country. Right? Like unless you're already in or unless you've got a lot of money and influence, you ain't getting in. And I know many of you have experienced that from relatives and from people you desperately want to visit or have visit you. So we should know what it's like for the kingdom to feel shut off. And the religious system of Jesus' day left the multitudes out. But Jesus welcomed them in. He touched them. He healed them. And he blessed the people that the system didn't bless. His message was anyone can come to God. And that was revolutionary. And you know what? They still can. It is still the good news of the Beatitudes is that anyone can come and they still can. So what is he really saying? Like if we were to interpret this in modern day language, if we were to maybe we can put the Beatitudes back up on the screen there. Um, and what, we're, what he's really saying are blessed other spiritual zeros. You thought you were on the outer, but it turns out you're on the inner. Blessed are those who mourn. You've lost it all. Maybe you've lost your health, your wealth, your children, your career, your relationships. But in light of what you've found in the kingdom, your tears are turning to laughter. Blessed are the meek the shy ones, the never fighting for what is yours, the often overlooked and taken advantage of. But in the kingdom, you're discovering the whole earth is God's and therefore you get to inherit it as one of his children. 
Blessed are those who burn with a desire for things to be made right. You've suffered injustice or maybe you've done the injustice. Maybe you're torn apart by guilt or maybe the trauma has completely reshaped your life for the worst. But any loss seems insignificant when the kingdom comes to your soul and you are filled and satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, those who don't always take what is theirs, the gullible, the quick to trust, and the often ripped off or taken advantage of. The ones the world has no respect for because you don't know how to do business in the world's ways. But in God, we find the mercy we've been looking for our whole life. Blessed are the pure in heart, the perfectionists, we might call them, where nothing is ever quite good enough not in them or in others. They pick at everything. They pick over motivations. They become the cynics. They want Jesus to wash, their, wash his hands even though they're not dirty. Their food is never cooked right. Their clothes and hair are always unsatisfactory. They can tell you what is wrong with everything. But in the kingdom, they will at last see something that satisfies their pure heart. They will see God. And they will find someone truly good enough. Blessed are the peacemakers, always caught in the middle and therefore never trusted by anyone because they don't take sides. But in that they resemble God, unwilling to put the blame on just one person and always working to bring about peace. Blessed are those who are attacked for standing up for what is right. They don't just suffer momentary harassment, but sometimes are labeled unfairly, cancelled. They miss promotions. They are not included in on things. They are blessed because they have an unshakable security in God's kingdom. And blessed are those who have gone off their rocker and taken up with following Jesus. They have their imaginary friend. Do they believe in Santa too? They are always misunderstood by the world, how they use their time, their money, their Sunday mornings, and where they have their faith. But in the kingdom, they will find joy because there is a great reward. This is what Jesus is getting at in the Beatitudes. The people regarded as lost causes who come to know the blessings of the kingdom. This is the message of the Beatitudes. Anyone can come and anyone still can. Anyone can come and anyone still can. It doesn't suggest there's anything good about poverty. It doesn't say, it's not saying blessed are those who are weep. It doesn't tell anyone to go and weep. It's just announcing and explaining, you over there, you over there, you over there, normally thought of as not blessed, are blessed. In spite of all of your conditions, the gospel of Jesus is moving towards your life and the kingdom of God is coming upon your life. And therefore, you are blessed. Our world says, blessed are the young, blessed are the skinny, blessed are the loved, blessed are the desired, blessed are the well-followed, blessed are the popular, blessed are the fashionable, blessed are the athletic. And that's why we spend so much time and money and worry trying to fit in these boxes. The world actually says, we can put this up in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The world says, blessed are you when you get to the top. You get everything, your basic needs, then you get your safety needs, and then you get your love and belonging, and you get your esteem, and this is how we see human development. This is a common psychological way of seeing it. But Jesus just dismantles this whole thing, not saying there's nothing to learn from it, but he just says, wherever you're at, you can be blessed. You don't need to wait till you get to the top. You can be blessed right where you are. You over there who feels on the outside, you're blessed. You're included. It's available to you. Blessed are the physically repulsive. Blessed are those who smell bad. Blessed are the twisted, the misshapen, the deformed, the too big, the too little, and the too loud. That might be me right now. <laughs> the bold, the fat, the old, you're blessed. Because you are riotously celebrated in the party of Jesus. The seriously crushed ones by our world, the flunk outs, the dropouts, and the burnt outs, the broke and the broken, the drug heads and the divorced, 
the HIV positive and the herpes ridden, blessed, blessed, blessed. The brain damaged, the incurably ill, the barren, the pregnant, way too many times and all the wrong times. The overemployed, the underemployed and the unemployed. The parents with children living on the street, the unemployable, the swindled, the shoved aside, the replaced, the lonely, the incompetent, the stupid, the emotionally starved and emotionally dead, blessed, 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 blessed. Jesus offered to all such people through relationship with him the present blessedness of his kingdom regardless of your circumstances. He offered to all such people the present blessedness of his kingdom. The present blessedness. Not to church people, although you too. Not just to nice people. Blessed, blessed, blessed. The condition of life sought for by human beings through the ages is attained in the quietly transforming relationship of Jesus. The condition of life that you've been searching for your whole life is attained through the quietly transforming relationship of Jesus. Blessed are the burnt out, blessed are the depressed, blessed are the renters, blessed are the indigenous, Blessed are the addicts. And don't think the moral issues exclude you either. Blessed are the murderers and the child molesters. Blessed are the brutal and the bigoted. Blessed are the drug lords and the pornographers. Blessed are the war criminals, the terrorists, and the rapists. The perverted, the filthy, and the filthy rich. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Not because they're living in this way, but because when the kingdom comes on your life, it doesn't matter what your past has been. You are blessed, blessed, blessed. There's no like, there's no limit. There's no like, oh man, if that's your past, this is all you can hope for in the kingdom. But blessed, blessed, blessed. The doors are thrown wide open in Jesus. Your past is no determiner of the blessings in the future. Look, if I, as a recovering sinner myself, can accept Jesus' good news, I can go to the mass murderer and say, you're blessed in the kingdom of God. There is forgiveness that knows no limits. To the predator and the perpetrator, the worshipper of Satan, those that rob the weak and the aged, to the cheater and the liar, the bloodsucker and the vengeful, blessed, 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 if you would just flee into the arms of the kingdom among us. Look, this is what's supposed to be special about the church. It's the place where the victim and the offender can stand next to each other with their hands lifted high and worship God together as they find their blessed reality. It's the complete obliteration of social and cultural distinctions as the basis of life under God. And I know at the moment we're fighting so hard for our tribes and our races, but I got news for you in the kingdom. Jesus destroys all that stuff. In Colossians 3, it says, don't lie to one another. You're done with that old way of life. It's like a filthy set, a set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put in the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life, custom made by the creator with his label on it. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone included in Christ. Can you hear it? Rich and poor, moldy and pakiha, men and women, able and not able, together and untogether, all get obliterated 
Because our blessed reality is in Jesus alone. It's not defined by gender, culture, race, ability. We come together and focus on what we have in common. Our new identity in the kingdom. That's why as you come in at our entrance where it says our values, and it says keep it real. That's what keep it real is. Keep it real is I am only blessed because the kingdom has moved upon my life. That is the only reason. And so I do not have to pretend I'm something I'm not. I don't have to pretend. And I certainly will never expect anyone else to pretend to feel like they are accepted by me. I refuse to have higher standards than Jesus. I refuse to have higher standards than Jesus. That's what it means to keep it real. 2 Corinthians 5 says, because of the decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. He's created new. The old life is gone. The new life emerges. Look at it. All of this comes from God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah Jesus, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work and making things right between them. We're speaking of Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. In general, I could put this quote up on the screen. In general, many of those thought blessed or first in human terms are miserable or last in God's terms. And many of those regarded as cursed or last in human terms may well be blessed or first in God's terms as they rely on the kingdom of Jesus. Many, but not necessarily all. The Beatitudes are a list of human lasts who at the individualized touch of heaven become divine firsts. The gospel of the kingdom is that no one is beyond beatitude because the rule of God from heaven is available to all. Everyone can reach it and it can reach everyone. We respond appropriately to the beatitudes of Jesus by living as if this was so, as it contains others and as it contains ourselves. This is who we're supposed to be as a church. This is who we are, actually. See it every week. If only you knew the horrible stories sitting next to you. Maybe you wouldn't feel so comfortable now. But I'm glad that you do. I'm glad that it's not a condition of where you sit and of who you spend your time with and of whether or not you gather because these are the people that gathered around Jesus. And we are those people. Some of our sins are more acceptable. Some of our sins are more tolerable, and less obvious. But we all sit here as people once not thought of as blessed. But who Jesus, when he moves upon our life, calls us blessed. So we started with the question, who's in on this good life? Or it's available to everyone and anyone through Jesus. Shall we pray? <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for calling every single one of us blessed. Would that seep deep into our souls today and shape the way 
we see our relationship with you in our lives. Holy Spirit, make it stick. Blessed, blessed.